Okay, and I think we can get started. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, as we start our program, I just want to begin with a couple of Zoom etiquette notes. Um, we appreciate everyone leaving themselves on mute for the main portion of the program. Your video on or off is your choice, but at the end of the program, when we have time for questions, you're more than welcome to turn on your video and sound in order to verbally ask a question. Um, we also welcome questions in the chat box throughout the program. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. So once again, good evening, and thank you for joining us for Mary Way and Elizabeth Way Champlain, Fashioning Lives Out of the Early fashioning lives out of art in the early republic um, with the Lyman Allen Art Museum tonight. Telling a story of struggle, innovation, and accomplishment, the Way Sisters explores the art of portrait miniatures and the role of portraiture in the years following the American Revolution, focusing on two remarkable understudied women artists and their sitters. This exhibition traces what is known of the sisters' art artistic production, celebrating their stylistic and material innovations. And you have about two more weeks to still see it on view now at the Lyman Allen Art Museum. It has been wonderful to welcome visitors to this outstanding exhibition over the past few months. There are so many different elements that draw viewers to elicit a response. Guests are sometimes literally drawn in with the sheer size of the works of art as the miniatures require close observation, sometimes even with a magnifying glass. Others are interested in the seen or understood tactility of the works, trying to perceive which parts are paper, cloth, and stitching. Guests also appreciate the works as representations of, of people, time, and place. Here to expand on this idea is Dr. Catherine Kelly. She is the editor of books at the Amahundro Institute for Early American History and Culture and affiliate professor of history at William and Mary. A prize-winning historian and editor, her interests focus broadly on gender, culture, and politics in the early American Republic. She contributed an essay to the Way Sisters exhibition catalog and is the author of Republic of Taste, Art, Politics, and Everyday Life in Early America. And tonight we also, of course, have on call Dr. Tanya Port, curator for the Lyman Allen and our lead on this exhibition. So once again, thank you all for coming and I'll pass it off to Dr. Catherine Kelly. Thank you so much, Eileen. And, and thank you, Tanya, as well for, um, for inviting me. Just a second, please. I'll begin with uh, the sort of blanket caveat apology that we all have. I'm actually at my home office in Norman, Oklahoma, working from home in the context of a pandemic. Um, I apologize in advance because we have one particularly obstreperous dachshund and someone in our household has been put on dachshund detail to try and keep the dachshund from participating in this program. I cannot guarantee that we will not be dachshund bombed at some point during the next hour. Um, apologies in advance for the for the possible dachshund um, for the possible dachshund uh, appearance. And um, I want to make two quick plugs before I begin. The first is for this absolutely gorgeous and lovely catalog book. I was delighted to see it when it arrived in the mail. I do hope that every single one of you can get out to see the show, but if you can, and even if you can, please do consider picking up a, a copy of the catalog. The essays are terrific, and they really did enrich my understanding and my thinking about the images in question. The other quick plug I want to make is for a book that now looks a lot more raggedy and not nearly as pretty as that catalog volume. This is my well-worn, totally um, marked up fly ear, dog ear copy of Ramsey McMullen's uh, edited collection of the sisters, Mary Way, um, Elizabeth Way Champlain, her daughter Eliza uh, Champlain Riley, and various family members' papers. That book is a wonderful introduction to a family who is as charismatic, as charming, and as compelling as any early American family I can think of including the Adamses. 
So if you are at all interested in reading about the lives and experiences of early American folks, please do consider checking that book out. I, I think you'll be um, not at all disappointed. Um, I was so excited when Tanya reached out to me this summer and told me about the exhibit and told me about the catalog that they were planning and all the events that they were planning to really elevate and amplify the importance of these two absolutely path-breaking um, artists, Mary Way and, and I always call her Betsy Way Champlain because I feel like I'm familiar with her. That's what her family called her. And if it seems disrespectful, I don't intend it to be, but I do think of her as Betsy. Um, I was so excited uh, to see that all of this programming coming together because um, they're re really remarkable, both in terms of the work that they produce, but also in terms of the life, uh, in terms of the lives that they live. And it was personally gratifying to me um, in a sort of a um, getting some of my own back revenge sort of way. It made me think back to a time when I was just starting to work on Republic of Taste and I was um, working with an editor with whom I did not end up publishing the book at all. But this editor wanted me to send out um, for peer review, um, anonymous peer review, some essays that I had written, short conference papers, many of which focused on Way and Champlain. And you know, to consider this as, a, as part of a, a precondition for getting a contract to write the book that would eventually become Republic of Taste. And she sent um, my conference papers about Mary Way and Betsy Ray Champlain to a very prominent art historian who responded that what I had to say was interesting. And he couldn't exactly say that these women were boring, but it was absolutely not art at all, not art history, not remotely pertinent to the concerns of art historians. And if I really, if I really wanted to, um, for this project to reach its full potential, what I needed to do was to find an art historian to partner with who could tell me what real art was all about, because whatever real art was all about, it was not about the way Champlain sisters. And so seeing this exhibition come together and see, seeing it come together as beautifully as it has um, under Tanya's guidance is deeply satisfying in no small measure because of that one early experience. Um, so let me get into the heart of, of my talk. And I will tell you right now, that I am not an art historian, as that very famous art historian immediately recognized. I'm a cultural and social historian. And I primarily think about um, Way and Champlain and the work that they do in a broad cultural context. Tanya can, and I believe has, and can give you a far closer reading, a far better glossing of particular images and the sort of ways that art historians and curators do. I'm more interested in the world that, um, that Betsy and Mary lived in and what we, that world can tell us about them and what they can help us see about that world. And I wanna begin by thinking about one of the kinds of problems that comes up often when you're teaching history. And it doesn't matter whether you're teaching college sophomores, whether you're teaching college seniors or whether you're teaching graduate students in history. And when they start to look at a book or when they start to look at a topic a subject of study, they often assess its value as to whether is it unique, is it valuable to study because it's unique, or is it valuable to study because it's representative. George Washington is valuable to study because he's singular, right? He's the only first president of the United States. He's in the, the commander in chief of the Continental Army. He is the man who would not be king. He is singular in all of these different kinds of ways. Um, Many historians would argue that that kind of uniqueness is what makes a subject valuable. Other historians would make the argument that what really matters is representativeness. They don't want a study, another study of singular George Washington. They want a study of the experiences of artisans during the revolution, in the period before the revolution and the period after the revolution. And even though we may never get a full sense of the life of any one of these artisans, if we take them together, we can be, build a composite picture of a larger world and that, that representativeness is really what matters. Um, most, much of the catalog text, including the text that I wrote, much of the exhibit on Way and Champlain weighs in on the sense of their uniqueness, on the extent to which these women 
our path-breaking artists are, are, are first of a certain sort in American art history and in American cultural history. We weigh in on the ways in which they are unique. And there are good reasons for that. They have been understudied and um, we can talk more about why they're understudied or how they've been understudied when we get to the Q&A, if you'd like. But what I wanna do this evening with your permission is to flip the script and not to talk so much about how they were unique, um, but how they are representative and how in thinking about their representativeness, how they fit into and are of a piece with larger cultural issues, with a larger cultural moment, they can help us gain new perspectives on the founding decades of the American Republic. Um, they can help us see larger patterns and larger moments. And I believe that if we reconstruct that world in which they lived in, those worlds in which we lived in, we can see them as being closely connected to what I would say are three of the key themes or narratives or topics of study when we think about the early Republic and the founding of the United States. Um, we can see them as helping us to understand education. That would be one. We can help, we can look at them and, and gain new insight into the founding of the Republic, what it meant to have a Republic, a culture that was suitable for a Republic what it meant to build or to create a Republican citizenry. And finally, we look at their careers and we rope in Betsy's daughter, Eliza Champlain, and later Riley, her married name, we can begin to get new perspective on the emergence of a market society and on women's position in that market society. And so those are the three things that I want to talk about. I'll be talking out way around in the margin or you know, in, 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 the, in a landscape that surrounds these women. And I'll loop back in and pull them into the story. What I'm really talking about here tonight more is history, cultural history, social history, intellectual history, than it is art history per se. So you, you've been warned. Um, and I wanna begin by talking about education. Mary Way and Betsy Way were products of a society that valued education in a way that was truly unprecedented by the time that they were born. And the reasons for that value on education, for that valuing of, valuing of education were multiple. Um, part of this simply has to do with a growing sense transatlantically of the importance of education. They're born into a world that is mercantile. London is a port city, obviously. Um, you needed to be able to have, to read, um, perhaps to write, to cipher at a basic level, to understand how commerce worked back and forth across the Atlantic. The trades and the professions that grew up around commerce, that's this transatlantic commerce, demanded a modicum of education. Um, they also grew up in a world where some education, including and especially perhaps women's education, was bound up with larger patterns and larger standards of gentility. To be able to educate your daughters, not only to read, but also perhaps to write, to educate them in fine ornamental needlework, to um, perhaps to play a musical instrument, perhaps to sing, perhaps to have a smattering of French, always useful in polite society, would was to be able to say something about your family's position in the world, about leisure, about um, your ability to provide a life for your family that, um, a life for your family in which your daughters, who would then go on to become wives in their own households, had the leisure to elevate themselves above the physical labor that um, dominated the lives of so many women. And in a more specific sense, uh, Wei and Champlain, these young, these, these two women, were born into um, a particular culture in New England that was the most literate in the world by any, by any metric in the 18th century. New England is, has the highest rates of reading literacy of any place in the Atlantic world, any place you know. Um, it had the highest rates of writing literacy as well. And reading and writing at that point were taught separately, they were imagined to be separate skills. So to have a society where people in general, but also women have high rates of reading and writing literacy was quite, quite remarkable. Um, 
that's the world that they're born into, but the world that they begin to create careers in and as artists understands education in those ways. But the world that they begin to paint in, the world that they begin to create art in, also understands education as having specific value in the context of the American Revolution. As I think probably many of you know, in the period following the American Revolution, education is valorized in, in Anglophone North America as it has never been valorized before. Education was the bedrock of a citizenry. Think about it. Subjects simply obey, right? That's what subjects do. They obey the decrees that are set down by kings and by betters. When, by the time that you get in, into um, the period of, with the founding of the Republic, citizens are expected to be able to read and to write because they have to make judgments. They have to discern, they have to decide who will be their representatives if they're property and then they can vote. They have to weigh in on matters of importance if only through their elected representatives. And so in the years following the revolution in the immediate aftermath of the revolution, there is this outpouring and this, if, this, this flowering of education, both in the founding of um, what we would now consider to be elementary schools or, 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 or common schools, but also in the founding of academies um, for young women and for young men, in um, the, the circulation of instructors who will offer sort of fly-by-night schools, literally in how to write, how to do math, how to do accounting, there's this sort of outpouring of, of education. Um, and a lot of what we know about that education or a lot of what we think about, a lot of what's familiar about that education is bound up with what we would consider to be good citizenship in ways that are familiar and maybe more obvious. You need citizens who can think, right? Who are, um, who are powered by reason. They're not powered by passion. They're not powered by impulse. You need them to be dispassionate. That is not fly off the handle, partisan, um, crazy, angry people. Um, and women in particular, as we often know, as scholars have long recognized, were meant to be educated precisely so that they could raise up citizens um, who were educated. Women have to be educated as Republican mothers so that they can educate their children to be good citizens. Women need to be educated as wives because if you've got an educated man, um, as women writers in the early Republic, Judith Sargent Murray notably say time and time again, what educated cultured Republican man wants to come home at night to a woman who can't read, who can't write, who can't think about anything but doing dishes and doing laundry. Women need to be educated to match their husbands. Um, that kind of Republican, specifically Republican valorization of education wasn't in play, as I said a moment ago, when Mary Way and Betsy Champlain were in school. But it does come into play uh, in the period when they begin to create their careers and the conditions of the world in which they are fashioning themselves as artists. And when we think about that education, it's important to understand that Reason, sure, you know, uh, historians and scholars often talk about um, this as being a, a, an education that's aimed at the enlightened cultivation of reason, but it was also an education. This has been, I think, less, um, less, less talked about. It was an education that was intentionally and richly aestheticized. It wasn't just about how to think with the logical part of your brain, it was also expected to be bound up with an aesthetic part of your brain, a way of thinking about beauty and art. Think for a moment simply about texts, about words, about words that are written on a page, whether they're printed or whether they're written with a pen. Now, today, in what, it's 2022, um, in a postmodern era, we think about text as being fungible, right? It can be pixelated on a screen. It can be printed out on paper. It can be written out in longhand. Um, but that text is always just a symbol of an abstract idea, a word that you know in your head. In the 18th century and in the early 19th century, in the world that these sisters live and 
produce art, live and paint and build careers. Um, text was also explicitly visual. And we can look at a slide. If we want to show that first slide now, you can stop looking at me and we can start looking at John Singleton Copley's stunning portrait of John Hancock. And this is um, the Boston Museum of, or Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And here, John Singleton Copley in the 18th century gives us this absolutely gorgeous picture of John Hancock right in. Look at how gracefully he's sitting in that chair. Um, he's absolutely elegant. His, his, um, his, the, the ruffles on his cuffs are somehow never getting in the way of the ink. Nothing is dirty, nothing is smudged. He's, um, his body is making extraordinarily graceful, he's, he's gracefully positioned. Um, he is as much the object of visual appreciation as the text that he's writing. Writing manuals in this period of time talk about texts, about writing, about penmanship as being both as much a, a visual and an aesthetic pursuit as simply a way of communicating information. And I think we could go to the next slide now. Um, on the, it's on the left on my screen. Um, you see a sample of a penmanship book. This is Nathaniel Ray Green's penmanship book. It's from the Nazareth Academy. This particular penmanship book is part of a collection at Winterthur Museum. Um, youth is violent, delay is dangerous, amendment in writing is commendable, kingdoms undergo continual revolutions. And you, you look at these penmanship books that are collected at Winterthur, and it's the same graceful script over and over and over again. I was stunned when I began looking at them um, you know, now a decade ago, it's impossible to tell whose pen, who's writing you're looking at. All of the boys have been schooled to create this text that is, is essentially identical. It's rhythmic, the, it's, the penmanship is about creating um, a sense of proportion with the letters, the, the slant of the letters, the movement of the letters is perfectly, um, is perfectly uh, evenly paced. It flows beautifully. Penmanship manuals and writing manuals from the 18th and the early 19th century talk about the visual beauty of the text, this penmanship that Nathaniel Ray Green and his peers have produced as being a piece with and an extension of the beauty of the physical beauty of the elegant writer's body, the kind of of lovely regular rhythm that you see in that penmanship is of a piece with John Hancock's graceful posture as he's writing in his book. Does that make sense? It's all, it's all visual, it's all aesthetic. It's for that reason you know, that you're going to look at writing and you're gonna learn physical, excuse me, this visual discernment. You're going to learn how to create an even pattern. You're going to be able to recognize style and proportion. Um, that students at the Nazareth Academy spent a great deal of time copying images um, from uh, Johann Daniel Preisler's drawing manual. And that's the image on the, on the, the right-hand side of my screen. Preisler was the director of the Nuremberg Academy in the early 18th century. As you can see from writing, from, from looking at that image from the drawing manual, um, it's a way of teaching drawing that emphasizes style, it emphasizes proportion. It's about learning how to observe. It's about learning how to see. It's about um, learning how to how shapes take form. It's not about creating a complete picture. Boys in academies learn to draw in precisely this aesthetic way. There is some practical application to this. It's, a, it's also these kinds of skills are useful for draftsmanship. But this is mostly about a visual education. It's connecting the eye and the hand. Girls at academies had a similarly aesthetic, um, aestheticized education. We can look at the next slide there. Um, in their case, the images that they create are far more pictorial. They're bound up with narrative. And you can see that here in this 
really lovely and sad um, morning embroidery that Lucretia Carew um, embroidered in 1800 to memorialize her sister. And this is one of the lovely pieces that is in the Lyman Allen um, ex exhibit that hopefully you will go and see. Um, Lucretia Carew was the daughter of Lucy Carew. She, Lucy Carew is one of these entrepreneurial female educators who's opening up an academy in the wake of the American Revolution. This commemorates the death of her sister. It is um, the faces and the, the, the hands of the, of the individuals in, in, the, in the pictorial embroidery are painted on silk. Um, the rest of it is very finely embroidered. Her mother almost certainly made the pattern or made this pattern and adapted it from someone else's pattern. Um, this kind of pictorial embroidery, not only um, memorial, but all, often refer, referencing scenes from literature, from poetry, is a common piece that runs through women's education. And again, it's got ties to a world of text, a world of, of learning, but it also has ties to um, and bespeaks a real emphasis upon the importance of, importance of the visual. It's important to understand that these things that you've been looking at this morning, um, this pictorial embroidery, the, the um, penmanship that Nathaniel Gray, Ray Green created in 1793, these aren't just created and saved as particular tokens of an individual student's skill that, that, um, you know, that their, their moms and dads hung on to because they were sentimental about their kids' accomplishments. These are meant to be public displays. And in fact, we could look at them at the next slide now. Um, at academies for men and women throughout the early Republic, um, aestheticized learning, penmanship, pictorial embroidery are put on display at annual and sometimes semi-annual examinations where the entire town would turn out to see the products of what young women and men had drawn. This lovely painting is Jacob Marling's The May Queen, The May Queen, The Crowning of Flora. It was painted in 1816. Jacob Marling was a, an art instructor at the Raleigh Academy. And this particular painting depicts um, a ceremony that is taking place there. The Raleigh Academy is a female girls' school in Raleigh, North Carolina. And you can see in this image, which looks a lot like the description descriptions that we have of examinations at female academies um, throughout the country, actually, how publicly these women's learning, um, how public these women's accomplishment and, and aestheticized learning becomes. Surrounding the girls who are lined up in their white dresses are members of the community. They've all heard out, they've all turned out to hear the girls recite poetry, sometimes of their own composition. Um, if this were, a, um, were an academy e examination, um, samples of student writing, their penmanship, their drawing, their essays, all of these things would have been put out on display for people in the town to come out and look, look at. And if you look at any, um, especially in New England, oy, especially in New England, if you look at um, local newspapers, exam new newspapers, magazines, the papers of people like William Bentley, who is the, the energetic diarist in Salem, Massachusetts, everyone turns out to go to these things. It's not just for the parents of the students. The entire community is invested in understanding that the young men and the women who are educated at these academies are gaining an education that is as aesthetic as it is logical or reasonable or what we might consider today to be narrowly intellectual. Um, and so Mary Way and Betsy Way Champlain are forging careers as artists in a culture that has made a decision to valorize an appreciation of art, an appreciation of things that are aesthetic, an appreciation of things that are um, and have that kind of value. Next slide, please. And this is this is um, just one very quick thing. This is a, a diploma um, from Sarah Pierce's Litchfield Female Academy that I think really nicely demonstrates the combination of 
aesthetic and academic, we would say now, um, accomplishment. It is on silk. Um, it's printed on silk, not on sheepskin. It's got a lovely engraved image. Um, and, and then the, the text at the bottom certifies that the, that the, um, the student has you know, graduated from or, or gotten through the school. Uh, through school there. Let's let's go to the to um, the next slide. Or actually, we could just get away from the slides. For, oh, yeah. Okay, we we'll, we'll stay here then. Um, the fact that schoolwork in this world, um, especially aestheticized schoolwork, fancy penmanship, pictorial embroidery, the fact that it becomes public, the fact that it becomes part of displays, the fact that it um, commands so much attention in communities, particularly throughout the, new, the Northeast, suggests that it is um, connected in some way to a larger Republican project. And I would suggest that it absolutely was. And by Republican project, I mean, and historians who use that phrase mean not simply the establishment of a Republican government, Congress, the Senate, the judiciary, the separation of powers, but when we talk about the Republican project, we're talking about not only governmental structures, but the larger peopling of society. How do you get, how do you make citizens who can function effectively in a republic? How do you create a good citizenry? How do you create a virtuous citizenry? What does it mean to have a culture that is properly Republican as opposed to being British or monarchical or European, and this is something that early, people in the early Republic worry about endlessly, not least because so much of their culture is imported directly from England. They're enormously anxious about the Americanness of their, of their culture. Um, much of what, of what young women and men are learning in these academies is directly connected to a Republican culture. And you can see that um, exemplified quite neatly in these two morning embroideries. Um, the one on the on my right with the with the soldier from the Continental Army, yes, right there. Um, Sacred to the memory of George Washington it was completed in 1805. It's at Colonial Williamsburg. The one on the right, also titled Sacred to the, to the Memory of George Washington, is now in the Smithsonian. Both of these are schoolgirls embroideries. Both of these were um, embroidered by, um, from patterns that were generated by Samuel Falwell in Philadelphia. Um, we don't know anything about who, who um, embroidered the image um, with the soldier. The speculation is that the image on, with the, with the three young women, the three, grace, three graceful young women in it was, completed um, by someone who was attending Falwell's wife's female academy. Um, but both of these images suggest that, that, um, that patriotism itself could be aestheticized, that patriotism itself could be rendered, love of country could be rendered in a way that was beautiful, that could be beautiful, and that, that should be beautiful. Um, and that beauty or in a sense of taste, a sense of elegance, a sense of gracefulness was an important part of being a member of the Republic. Um, next slide, please. That sense that love of country and love of beauty or love of country and taste could merge together is all over the art and the material culture of the early Republic. This is a bed curtain um, now at Colonial Williamsburg. It's the apotheosis of Franklin and Washington. It was made in Britain, mass produced there, and marketed in the United States. And we talk about um, people in the United States in the early Republic being anxious about the, authentic, the American authenticity or the authenticity of their Americanness. Um, this might be a case in point. They're buying things from Britain to, to demonstrate the patriotic authenticity authenticity of the American Revolution. And in this bed curtain, you see both Benjamin Franklin um, and George Washington. Franklin is, where is Franklin? 
Franklin is up. Can we see Frank? Franklin is next to the temple. He's yeah, right there. That's Benjamin Franklin and George Washington is on the horse down there. Washington is often depicted on a horse because he had excellent skills as a horseman. Um, these kinds of things circulate, not just because they're available, but because they help demonstrate that the buyers, um, that the people who made objects like the ones that we just looked at, the, the morning embroideries, who looked at things like this, had taste. And taste was seen as being central to what it meant to be a citizen in the Republic. We think about, and we could go to the next slide, please. We think about what it means to be a citizen as you know, having a sort of a rigid, perhaps moral core in the 18th century. We think about it as being um, reasonable or rational, but in fact, taste, the ability to have taste, the ability to exercise taste was closely connected to a sense of what made for virtuous civic um, participation. Um, taste depended upon the ability to tell good from bad. What is the better picture? What is the worst? You know, if you're going to buy a piece of art, which is the good piece of art to buy? What is which novel is in better taste than some other novel? That's discernment. Aesthetic discernment was connected to political discernment again and again and again. Um, in political theory, when people are writing about politics in the 18, um, the 18 aughts, the 18 teens, and the 1790s, political discernment is connected to aesthetic discernment. And the capacity for taste to be able to determine what has a value is connected with someone's moral compass. It's not, we, we may think of taste today as being something that's only connected to um, the market to the to one's ability to pick between cheaper and more um, more exclusive commodities, but taste in this world really does have a sense of um, of of more. It has a moral dimension, and it could be exercised in multiple modes. People in the early Republic talk about taste as having, you know a literary dimension, they talk about rhetoric and poetry and music in terms of taste, but taste is understood to be especially and primarily visual. You apprehend the world that you live in visually. This is, this is the primary sense for, for men and women in the 18th and early 19th century. Information about the world comes to you through your eyes it enters into your brain there, it processes with affect and emotion, and it's projected back out into the world. You can't be a citizen in the early Republic without having the capacity to exercise taste as well as um, what we might consider to be reason or reasonable judgment. Is this making sense? Is this clear? It's so, such an odd way to think about citizenship. Um, I don't think that that is how we think about um, citizenship or civic participation at all now, but it was very much of a point um, of a point then. That sense of the civic importance of taste, something that could be made manifest in the pictures that you embroidered when you were a schoolgirl, in your penmanship, or also in the objects that you acquired, the objects that you acquired to grace your home with, is imbued with not just a sense of gentility or class, but also with the sense of, of Republican importance um, to participate in this increasingly rich visual and material culture, to be able to purchase the kinds of images and objects and books and magazines um, that spelled, that signified that you had taste to a larger world, had political value as well as um, value as a sort of a social marker. Next slide, please. Um, for the Way and Champlain sisters, and this is where I'm going to loop back to them explicitly, that capacity to see, to exercise their, their their visual cognition to exercise their taste 
was central to how they thought about themselves as painters, as artists. You know, um, neither one of them has had access to studio training. Studio training. They get their training where they can. They scrabble for it. They scramble for it. They struggle for it. When Mary Way moves to New York, excuse me, early in the 18 teens, she gathers up all of the information that she can from all of the painters she meets. She borrows books and paint, you know, manuals on how to paint an oil portrait, um, how to paint an ivory miniature. Um, she copies paintings relentlessly and she funnels all of this information back to her sister, Betsy, um, Betsy Wei Champlain, whose self-portrait is in the image on the, on the left. Um, they're scrambling, scrambling, scrambling to get to basically to learn how to paint. How do you mix paint? Um, where do you get paint? How do you get watercolor to stick to ivory? These are technical mechanical questions. They involve the hand. They, they involve a physical body manipulating paint, manipulating ink, manipulating a coloring substance on a surface. And yet, when the sisters write about this back and forth to one another, they don't talk about it in manual terms, almost ever, never. Rarely do they talk about those kinds of technical details, um, the sorts of technical details that might fill up the correspondence of other artists and painters. They talk about learning to paint and they talk about what it means to be um, an artist in terms of their ability to see and to discern the world around them. Um, connoisseur, a word that is bound up with taste, is everywhere in their correspondence. In 1814, Mary Way has been in New York City for just a couple of years. She's trying to create. Um, she's a self-supporting artist, and she's trying to become a more financially successful self-supporting artist. She finally pauses and sits down and writes a very, very long letter to Betsy, talking about what it is that she's learned in New York City. All of what she has to say is about learning how to see, to be able to actually see color, to see the right colors, to see the, 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 um, the nuanced colors, not the bright, bold colors. Again and again in their correspondence, Mary Way, Betsy Way Champlain, and eventually uh, Betsy's daughter Eliza position themselves to each other as people who understand how to see the world around them differently than other people do. They picture themselves and they depict themselves as, core, as connoisseurs. Um, their letters are peppered with discussions about what they see and how their capacity for sight makes them special. So for example, um, at one point, a few years later, it's in the late 18, um, late 18 teens, uh, Mary Way has a young friend, Charlotte White in New York City, who has had one bad relationship. And she had to dump a, she, she dumped a fiance. She's got a new beau, a new fiance. She's, slightly better prospect. She sends the guy to Mary Way to paint, a, to paint his portrait in miniature. And Charlotte, the young woman, doesn't simply want a picture of her boyfriend. It's not just that. She believes that Mary Way's capacity for sight, her ability to look at this young man, will enable her to see the truth about him. And that Mary Way will be able after studying him, after examining him and painting him to tell Charlotte whether he's really someone she should be considering marrying. Um, and as Mary Way says, um, I looked at him and I studied him and I painted him. She says, I connoisseured him. I sized him up, judging him by my capacity for taste, by my special capacity for sight. And I decided that he was a better, he was a better bet all the way around than the first boyfriend um, that she'd had. Um, as Mary Way put it in an early letter to her sister, Betsy, learning how to see and learning how to see the way that she could see 
how she taught herself to see in New York City, enabled her to acquire a kind of property in everything you see. If you have that kind of painter's sight, you can see anything, um, you can see anything more clearly. Um, as these kinds of, we can go, we're gonna go really quickly through the next few slides because I've talked longer um, than, I, than I thought I might. Um, next slide, please. As these kinds of images, um, yeah. as, as ideas about taste and connoisseurship imbued as they are with Republican significance and political significance uh, increase over the course of the early 19th century, they also become part of the market. Um, there's a growing market for portrait miniatures, for all kinds of different art and artifacts. And here um, you see a pair of portraits that are, a, this is one of my favorite pair um, attributed to Betsy Way Champlain that are in the Way Sisters exhibit um, at Lyman Allen. It depicts, uh, it's a pendant, pendant portraits depicting Mr. and Mrs. Briggs painted around 1820. This is the kind of art that becomes increasingly available to middle-class families. It becomes increasingly the kind of thing that one can purchase for oneself and one's family. Um, as, uh, as these kinds of objects become more available, as they become more popular, growing numbers of people, men and women, begin to seek out careers as artists. And this is just about where I'm gonna wind up. And I wanna conclude really quickly with the next slide, um, talking about what happens to Eliza, Eliza Champlain Riley. She's Betsy's daughter, and she's not unfortunately represented. I think she's not, a, she's not in the exhibit. No, there was not a way to, um, there was not a way to include her in the exhibit. But I think she's a really important part of the larger story about what this family of women can tell us. You know, I mentioned a moment ago that both Mary and Betsy struggle for a lack of studio training, like the vast majority of working painters in the early Republic. They have to scramble for training and, and sort of string it together when and where they can. And that that paucity of training is a problem that is especially acute for female artists. The only young women in the early Republic who have access to studio training are related to Charles Wilson Peale. I mean, that's because it comes with a family, but whether you want it or not, you've got it. Mary Way and Betsy Way are absolutely insistent that Betsy's daughter, Eliza, will have studio training. They are absolutely insistent that she will have the kind of access and the kind of training that they themselves lack. And so from a pretty early point in Mary Way's career in New York City, Betsy continually um, shuttles Eliza into the city, into the city, study with your aunt, study with your aunt, meet her contacts, meet her, her patrons, learn, go to all the exhibits that she goes to, take whatever it is that she can, she can give you either in terms of her own skills or in terms of um, her access to clients, to, to culture, to a larger world. I'm not gonna weigh in on the relative degree of Eliza's skill. And you can see the real difference in the kind of work that she's producing here in terms of um, how exuberantly decorative it is, how it's much brighter. We don't have, as far as I know, any of her extant portraits, but the written evidence that we have suggests that she, um, she uses far brighter colors. They tend to be a little bit busier in, competition, in composition than her aunts or her mothers. So what we do know for sure is that she cannot make a living at all doing this. Mary Way ekes out a living until she's blinded. Betsy Way ekes out arguably a more secure living until she dies um, in 18, 1826. Eliza Champlain can't make a living at all. Why not? It's not, one might imagine, that she lacks skill. Part of the answer is that she doesn't have her mother's or her aunt's drive. But what is absolutely true is that 
New York City is flooded with people who will, who will, um, who will underbid her. The competition is so stiff that she can't, she can't get a foothold. She cannot um, succeed by opening a, a school for, to teach young girls how to paint fancy or ornamental pictures like this. And the one on the right, um, Iris, the sort of fairy lady with the blue, blue robe, that little, that round one, that's a watch paper. That's actually sized to fit into a pocket watch about yay, about yay big. Something that is that small on paper is literally ephemeral. Even if you sell them, you can't make enough money to, you, it is it's virtually impossible to support oneself in this, in this context. By the time that Eliza Champlain, <coughs> excuse me, is trying to create a career as an artist, the market is so absolutely saturated that she cannot succeed. Um, and she winds up abandoning all hope of a career in art. And um, when she marries in 1826, she gives it up entirely. And I think that that's where I'm gonna stop. I've gone on longer and I think faster than I thought I was going to, but I would love to, um, to answer questions. Maybe we can pop out of the slides and people I think should feel free either to put questions in the chat or to, um, or to um, raise your hand and turn on your camera if you're feeling like, or, or simply um, verbalize uh, without that. Um, we do have one question from Maggie Redfern. Where can one access the Way Sisters correspondence? You can get it in two different places. You can get it um, through Ramsey McMullen, Sisters, Sisters of the Brush. And I'm gonna actually type that into the chat. There we go. Um, you can also, depending on where you live, how far you're willing to travel, the, the collection itself is at the American Antiquarian Society. And I know that they're opening back up for business in the context of the pandemic, but you can go and, and find their papers there. And Tanya did a great deal of work there, I think, in preparation for this exhibit, yeah? Um, okay. Thank you, Beth. Other questions, thoughts? Yeah. Is I have a, qu a question. Oh, um, I that. was, no, it's that. Irene. Oh, I just clicked on the link. I scared myself with my computer. Um, I was a little surprised to see the, the patterns. I think when you're a typical museum visitor, um, you don't necessarily see that repetition of display. I think a lot of museums probably have eight of the same pattern <laughs> in their holdings, but you, you rarely see them on display. At what points in your research for either Catherine or Tanya, um, do you start to really see which patterns were keen, were most important, which were in some ways visual trends for what either young women or gentlemen were expected to follow in their creation of different art. Tanya, do you wanna jump in? Um, yeah, I mean, in some instances, you know, there are multiple examples of compositions by young women, you know, coming out of a particular school that are very, very similar. Um, and, you know, in those cases, sometimes you don't necessarily always know what the, um, you know, what the original sort of composition was, but the fact that there are several that are, are almost the same, you know, uh, leads you to believe, of course, that there, there is a pattern and people like Samuel Falwell, um, as Catherine said, um, created, um, a number of these and the Way Sisters, uh, Mary writes about drawing a design um, that's used by a young women's academy, you know, for a particular embroidered piece. Um, so it was common, I think, for artists, um, 
you know, to sometimes draw out designs for these complicated, really ornate um, pieces of embroidery. Um, but it's an interesting thought, yeah, to sort of think about. And, and some of these themes, um, as the two that we saw in the presentation, this sort of mourning, um, uh, you know, after George Washington was, was a very, very prominent theme variations on on some of those morning embroideries um you know you see again and again with um variations but you know similar um similar sort of themes and allegorical symbolism which is fascinating to think about you know sort of what what those pieces embody and why they were so compelling um as as teaching tools for young women and the thing that I would add there, and I would love to claim this as my insight, but it isn't. It's um, my, my friend Hunt Howell, um, who's written about pictorial embroidery. A lot of this sort of the, what we might call um, the formulaicness, the, the repeated pattern, the way that certain kinds of motifs appear again and again and again, the fact that these girls are embroidering, these young women are embroidering, um, following patterns that have been given them by their teachers, um, as opposed to creating something new on their own, that's intentional. And it's intentional not just because it's the best or most cost-effective way to generate a pictorial embroidery. It's intentional in the sense that while you're doing this and creating this picture, you're creating, you're, you're engaging in a discipline that's supposed to build a particular kind of taste and character. It's not about you becoming the most you version of you you can be. It's about you submitting to a whole, um, a whole lexicon of conventions that will make you a better artist, but will also make you a better citizen. It's how citizenship gets modeled as following the pattern, follow the pattern, follow the patterns, don't go out on your own, don't become wildly individual, that's a bad idea, um, but rather conform to the pattern of what a good Republican citizen is. So when we look at the school or embroidery and we see it, that sense of pattern and repetition is there before the revolution, but it takes on this sort of hyper-politicized um, importance afterwards as well. Um, we have a question that wants to go to the miniature portrait that's to the right of the Betsy self-portrait. I would love to go back and see that and say a few things about it. That's one of my favorite images and I skipped right over it because I was worried about time. Oops. While well, Tanya's pulling that up, we had another question that was how did the how did they promote themselves as painters to get commissions? I think, yeah, in the uh, exhibition or in the catalog. There so are, yeah. Mary Way advertises. <laughs> she takes out ads in a newspaper. Um, and she uh, she's very energetic about trying to meet other artists, all of them male, in in New York City. And she works through their connections. Um, she works through a pretty dense, according to her letters, what we can gather from her surviving letters, she works through a pretty dense patronage network of people who know each other uh, through, through churches and through other kinds of associations. Um, Betsy Way advertises herself because she's a New London painter. New London is small enough at that point in time that, uh, and maybe still small enough that Everybody knows that she is the painter of record. Um, and Betsy Way also um, advertises and promotes herself by willing to do literally, literally anything. I mean, she, she, she does, um, she paints lots of, she, she eventually begins taking portraits of corpses um, because as, as she explains, um, people die, they want to memorialize, um, their, their, their loved one. And when they're in the middle, Betsy's, I think, got a really mordant wit. Um, and when they're grieving like that, you can basically ask them to pay whatever you want because what they're not gonna, they're not gonna haggle over the price. So it's a really good gig to paint, um, to paint corpses, even though the corpses are not so easy to paint because you can't really move them and they won't rearrange their features. Uh, anyway. So the painting on the right, this unfinished self-portrait, um, we don't know who that sitter is. We don't have a date on it. 
but what I um, what I love about that image, and I I published a fair amount of stuff using that image, is that because it is half done, um, and Betsy's self-portrait is also unfinished. Betsy's self-portrait was intended as a swap. She was going to paint one of herself and send it to Mary. And Mary, who's at that point beginning to lose her sight to glaucoma, is going to paint one of herself and send it to Betsy. And these are supposed to be uh, a swap. And Mary never completes hers. And Betsy never completes. I don't think Mary ever starts hers. Betsy can't complete hers and doesn't. But what I love about the, the other image of this unknown sitter is that because it is half done, we can see Betsy, um, we can see how she's applying color and starting to think about the coloration of skin, about the depiction of complexion, um, about how she's gonna try and get some of the color into the sitter that she writes about with her, with her sister. Um, there's a point in the, in the 18 teens where they're, spending a lot of time talking about how you can light a subject and watch the subject skin glow and how you can then capture that glow on ivory. And this is the one portrait of um, the one portrait that I've seen associated with Betsy where you, I can actually see that taking place. And so that's um, that's what I think that's what I find remarkable about about that particular image. And we don't know why the sitter never came to collect it. We don't know why, how it comes to be within her, you know, how it comes to be still within Ramsey McMullen's collection, which is where both of these, both of these images are from. Ramsey McMullen is a descendant of Betsy and, um, and Mary. So that's, that's, the, that's that. Did I see a, a verbal question perhaps to be posed or give another second? Yeah, there we go. Lois? Hello? Um, I haven't seen the exhibit yet. I'm going this weekend, but um, in the past when I've seen some of these, they're attributed to the Way sisters. Can you talk about why or are they all attributed or how are some authenticated? That's a Tanya question. Um, Thank you. That's an excellent question. It's um, largely because most of them are unsigned. Um, and so, and we're still in the process of kind of sorting out or trying to understand perhaps which sister did which piece. Um, and so you say attributed to, there's a little bit of leeway in there, um, you know, which means we think one or the other sister um, created one, you know, these pieces, but, um, you know, as most of them are unsigned, um, that's a sort of, you know, typical convention um, to, you know, leave a little bit of uncertainty there that, that this is what we think, but we don't know 100% for sure. Tanya, how, as you're trying to sort through questions of attribution, how useful are the papers? to you in terms of thinking about, because they sometimes they'll mention, if you know who the sitter is, they mention that they're trying, you know, the, the, the image that you um, sent me that wasn't included in the, in the exhibit, um, the Murray painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, how, 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 do, how did the letters help you think about attribution? It's, um, it's fascinating. And I feel like there are sort of several different categories of these pieces. So there are pieces that are known through the letters where the sisters are talking about commissions and people sitters and so forth. Um, and some of those are known and identified, others are not. Um, and then, uh, so in some cases, you know, you're sort of looking for, for unknown pieces out there. Um, and then there's also this sort of um, objects that we know exist, and some of them, um, the identity of the sitter has been lost. So they're, you know, they're they're unidentified individuals, and it's there's a lot that's still unknown. Um, there were a few things that where the letters were able to help us kind of track down a particular object. Um, there is a group portrait of um, 
Charles Holt, Mary Holt and their children um, that is reproduced in the exhibition. It isn't included, but it's a piece that I tracked down because there's some really nice description in the letters um, where Mary talks about painting this whole extended family in New York. Um, and I sort of did an internet search, um, you know, for sort of their names and then something popped up and I was able to track down um, and find a piece that's in a private collection, not very close by um, and, and got an image of it to include. Um, but what was a challenge for this exhibition is that the sister's identity was lost and then sort of rediscovered um, with the publication of an article by Bill Warren in 1992 in an article in the magazine Antiques. Um, and one using one miniature that is a signed example by Mary Way um, of Charles Holt, who is, um, you know, the sitter who is, is sort of on the face on our catalog. Um, and that enabled the identification of a group of, of miniatures that were dressed by the hand of Mary and then Betsy. Um, but because of that, a lot of them, I think, are maybe out there listed as unknown artists, because that's how they had been classified for a very long time. So it's only it's been sort of a, a process in some cases of finding pieces, um, you know, where maybe a sitter is known, but the artist is still listed as unidentified um, because the sisters, you know, all that information hasn't necessarily been been reconnected yet. Can I ask a question, sort of a follow up question to that? Why yeah. not? Um, nobody else has a question. Can I can I do we have time? So one of, one of the things that I um, I hadn't really thought much about until I got the catalog and started actually looking at the catalog and the images in the catalog is how much of Mary Way's dressed miniature work survives, which is really early for her. And she, you know, she, as far as we can tell, she stops doing that kind of thing when she gets to New York. She moves to New York so that she can stop doing that kind of art. Um, so much of that survives relative to her other work that, you know, she, she did landscape painting in theory, um, among other things in New York City. We have a wider range of what Betsy does, I think. Um, how do we account for the the outside survival of the dress miniatures. Does that make sense as a question? I mean, I think because they're so distinctive, they, oh. they can't be confused with the work of anyone else. Whereas some of the later work on ivory and on paper, um, you know, I think as the sisters progress in their career or do more unusual things, you know, that we don't know to associate with them, um, they aren't necessarily recognized as being by their hands, um, is my guess. I think, I don't know if Ellie Shushan is still on here, but she um, is someone who's been attentive to thinking about attribution um, and has had thoughts, um, you know, as this process has evolved, as have other people. Um, if anyone else wants to chime in, any, any thoughts? Um, but yeah, I'm hoping that, you know, that this research will continue to evolve and will more pieces will come to light and will, you know, gradually be able to have a richer understanding of their bodies of work. That would be lovely. Ideal. Yes. Um, but I think we are probably over time on, a, on our limit. Um, I don't know. So maybe we should wrap it up, but sort of keep these thoughts in mind for the future. Um, and we're so grateful to you, Kathy, for sharing all of this information and ideas with us. It really helps broaden our understanding of the objects in the exhibition. And a few things like this portrait here on the right that um, sadly aren't included in the exhibition um, to, to really wrap our heads around the sister's work and Eliza's work as well, which which sadly we don't have in the show. Yeah. Well, thank you all. I just, I'm so grateful for all of the work. 
that you've done um, to pull the exhibit together. I can't encourage everybody who is on this screen strongly enough to go and see the exhibit, um, get the catalog. It's all really lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you all.